The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. Hello, and welcome to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. My name is Joni Siegel, and I'm the host for this podcast. My husband, Steve Siegel, is the co-founder and producer of the podcast. Just a reminder to please subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star rating so that when people are looking for help with addiction, they find our podcast. And it is always our hope that the stories that are told on this podcast will give hope to someone who listens. Please also subscribe to our YouTube channel and give our videos a thumbs up. For the same reason, just so that when people search for podcasts or help with addiction, they find us. Today's episode is episode number 343, and today we have an interview. We have an interview with a gentleman named Barry Meyer. Barry Meyer is a former Pulitzer Prize winning journalist for the New York Times and the author of three books, including Painkiller which first shed light on the opioid epidemic and the secretive Sackler family. Painkiller, initially published in 2003, has been hailed as groundbreaking, a landmark, and a muckraking classic. During nearly four decades as a reporter at the Times, the Wall Street Journal, and Newsday, Meyer uncovered threats to the public's health, revealed political and business corruption, and exposed the notorious NXIVM I don't know how to say that, but the Nixivum cult in which women were branded. He's also a two-time winner of the prestigious George Polk Award for investigative reporting. Along with Painkiller, his other nonfiction books include Missing Man, which told the story of a former FBI agent who disappeared in Iran while working for the CIA, and Spooked, which investigated the booming private investigations industry and its impact on business, politics, and our lives. He's a frequent guest on television and radio programs and has appeared in documentaries. Today, we're talking to him because of his novel, Painkiller, which is very shortly to be released, possibly already by the time you watch this, on Netflix as a series starring Matthew Broderick and Taylor Kish, among others. Without further ado, let's talk to Barry Meyer. Barry Meyer, am I saying it properly, Meyer? Correct. Barry Meyer, thank you so much for being willing to talk to us today on the podcast. I know it's an extremely busy time for you, and we will get to why that is, but I appreciate you being with us today. Joni, thanks for having me. Absolutely. Barry, how did you get into investigative reporting? Give us just a little bit of background on you and how you got into that. Well, you know, I stumbled into journalism through a very unorthodox uh, path, I say. <laughs> um, I wanted to be a fiction writer. Uh, and in my 20s, I supported myself by being a handyman. I painted apartments. I did carpentry work. And I was really uh, most absorbed. I wanted to be like a detective novel writer kind of like a Dashiell Hammett. <laughs> uh, and um, sadly, I wasn't very good at it. So I wrote a couple of novels that I couldn't sell. And then uh, I started doing, you know, odd jobs and, and, you know, working for temp agencies. And they would send you to different places. And eventually they sent me to a publication called Floor Covering Weekly, which was a trade magazine that covered the carpeting and tile industries, right? Uh, and I was doing a, a directory that they put together. I was pasting up, you know, which is the way things used to work in publishing. You know, you'd get type and you'd paste it down on a page and it'd be shot. And one day, one of the guys there came over to me and said, you know, I'm supposed to write an article, but I can't do it. I've got a lot of work. So do you want to do it? And I had never written, you know, any kind of article before, but he said, you know, we'll pay you X dollars. And I said, sure, I'll be happy to do it. And somehow I was able to, and they eventually hired me to write more articles. And then I got a job um, 
with another trade publication called Chemical Week, which was part of McGraw-Hill, a big publisher at that time. And I became the environmental editor of of Chemical Week. Uh, This was the, you know, the 80s. So the environment and chemical pollution was a big story. And uh, I stumbled onto documents showing that uh, Dow Chemical, one of the biggest chemical companies in the country, um, which made the chemical defoliant Agent Orange during the Vietnam War, um, had dumped Agent Orange into the water supply of the town in Michigan where the company was based. And I wrote a story about this, and they flipped out. And they flew in their top executives to Manhattan. They came to the offices of Chemical Week and they expected the editor of this magazine to fire me on the spot, which to his credit, he didn't. He was very supportive. He was a good guy. And um, the upshot was that the Wall Street Journal was looking for someone to cover the chemical industry. Someone there saw my articles about Dow Chemical, and they hired me. And so here I was, a college dropout who hadn't had any professional training in journalism, being hired by one of the biggest newspapers in the country. And so Barry, I, can I just ask you, because I'm just I'm listening to you tell the story, and I'm like, Okay, I'm not going to say it that way. How how did you I did how did you have the guts to write something like that? I mean, you were now writing about one of the biggest chemical corporations in the country. I mean, I don't know. I guess you could basically say I had a bad attitude. Okay, you know? all I, right. I subscribe to that way. I didn't care. You know, I felt, you know, that there was an injustice. Yeah. That was being done. And throughout what would be become a very long reporting career, I was always motivated and stirred by injustices. I remember a colleague at the Wall Street Journal coming to me and saying to me, you know, Barry, you are the kind of reporter that will always do stories about the little guy that's getting hurt. And I said, yeah, that's right. And so I became a reporter at the Wall Street Journal. I managed to learn how to write newspaper articles, essentially by the seat of my pants. I almost got fired several times. And I was naturally drawn to investigative reporting and started doing stories like that for the journal. I then was subsequently hired by a newspaper here in New York, Uh, called New York Newsday, to be an investigative reporter for them. And that was very brief, because in 1989, I got a call out of the blue from an editor at the New York Times, who told me that, Barry, we've seen your work. We'd like you to come in for an interview. And I was hired by the Times. Wow. And that would be the beginning of what was essentially a 30-year-long career at the New York Times. Well, so let, me, let, let me just blessed. say, sorry, editorial comment. I mean, thank you for having the guts to to stand up to some of these um, these powers, if you will, and tell the story that needs to be told. Not as you know, not everyone is has the chutzpah to do that. So, thank you. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Okay. So now you're at the New York Times, and take us from there. I did interrupt you. Apologize. Sometimes. The hardest thing about getting someone into recovery is getting them to agree to treatment. Bobby Newman, a certified drug counselor with 30 years experience and an over 85% success rate as an interventionist, has created a series of 12 videos that you can use right now to learn every step to get your loved one to agree to treatment. Call 866-989-4499 today and say the word podcast to get a 10% discount or go to newmaninterventions.com 
and type in the word podcast for a 10% discount. This service comes with a free one hour consultation with Bobby. So I'm doing any number of stories at the times and to, uh, I was, uh, in, in the late nineties, um, I was asked to cover all the tobacco litigation, uh, that was being brought all the litigation that was being brought by the states against the tobacco industry. Hmm. So I did that for about two years or so. Uh, that kind of ended. And in 2001, I was sitting at my desk, kind of happily minding my own business, waiting, I guess, for the clock to hit four or five so I could go hmm. home. And um, an editor came up to me, a guy who was a friend of mine and uh, a very good investigative reporter himself. And he said to me, you know, I just got a call from a friend of mine who's on the pharmacy board of in Ohio or some Midwestern state who said to me, you know, there's this new hot drug on the street. It's called OxyContin. And the strange thing about it is that all the drug drug reps for its producer are going around and telling doctors and pharmacists that it's kind of a wonder drug. It's that it's got this special coding that makes it virtually impossible to be abused and patients won't get addicted to it. And that was the first time that I'd ever heard about Oxycontin, its manufacturer, Purdue Pharma, or the owners of Purdue, the Sackler family. <laughs> and at that time, I knew nothing about the pharmaceutical industry, about, you know, prescription narcotics or opioids, as they were called, you know, became to be called, about drug addiction. Um, I had a clue about what was going on, hmm. but I'd follow the story. And in time, it took me down. It turned out that the tip we got was right, that this company was promoting this drug in a way that wasn't true, that dozens of people were starting to overdose from it. And there were hot spots in these various places like Western Virginia, Maine, Florida, Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, that doctors were starting to set up pill mills to sell OxyContin prescriptions for cash. And um, I started writing stories about it through 2001. I got a call from a Purdue insider who met me and gave me a list showing all the top selling sales reps, the toppers as they call them, wow. in the in the country, and where their sales districts were. And this person said to me, "If you look at these districts, every one of them, there's a pill mill." that these sales reps were servicing. And it became very clear to me that Purdue Pharma knew what was going on, mm. that they were turning a blind eye to what was going on. Wow. So I just kept writing through 2001, writing story after story, maybe a dozen of them that year for the Times. And then I left and uh, I started working on the book, Painkiller. And I set that book in this small town in Western Virginia, the Western part of Virginia called right. Pennington Gap, where there was a doctor, Art Van Zee, his wife, a nun, Sister Beth, and a group of people who were trying to sound the alarm about the predatory practices of Purdue, the damage that OxyContin was doing. And I used their story 
to chronicle what was becoming the biggest prescri prescription drug disaster of our times. Wow. Well, so this was in this was in the early two thousands. Correct. The book came I, out in two thousand two. Uh, three. I'm sorry. And it's amazing to me how many people didn't know about it at that time. Correct. Yes. I know we it, we had no idea until we started the podcast, which was in two thousand late two thousand seventeen, and no idea of this whole oxycontin epidemic or any any of that. And I think that the general public was in the same boat. It's it's absolutely true. I mean, you know, the book of painkiller, which I thought was important, I was hoping would sound an alarm bell went out of print after a year. It sold so few copies because no one was interested in this subject. They thought it was just an issue that maybe was affecting a few people in some small towns that they never, had never heard about and would never pass through. Wow. You are listening to the Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information on the podcast or to reach out if you have a story you would like to share with us, go to our Facebook page by the same name, or you can email us at theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com or go to our website, theaddictionpodcast.com. And please remember to subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts and give us a five-star review. And over the next 15 years, as this epidemic grew and grew, and you know the number of d overdose deaths climb from the dozens annually into the hundreds, into the thousands, into 10 or 15,000 annually. During that entire time, you know, people who we expect to protect us, you know, lawmakers and regulators and professional medical organizations either were co-opted were corrupted or were powered into doing nothing while the pharmaceutical in industry downplayed this carnage. And it was just shocking and stunning for me to see. Yep. Yep. Um, again, thank you for having the courage to stand up against uh, a, a monster, if you will, like Purdue Pharma that was that big and the pharmaceutical industry because, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for doing that. Um, how did the, so the, has the book been republished now? It has. I, okay. I'm very happy to say it's it's come out in a new paperback version okay. in connection with the Netflix series and it's it's a, in my mind it's it's a great exciting easy read you know most people read it they say i got hooked i read it in a day i read it in a day and a half um and i think what it does and i know there've been lots of other books and articles written about this but when you read this book you're seeing it essentially through the eyes of someone as it's happening, as this tragedy is beginning, and and the forces that are creating it. It's a horrifying story. And what I think makes it even, if it were just fiction, if it were just something that you had made up, okay, it would be a horrifying story. The fact that it's true takes it to a whole other level that is you know horrifying to the max how did ne how did the netflix series come about how did that come about barry sure well you know the book had sort of a long journey uh from the from the page to the screen uh it was originally optioned when it came out but at that time again you know, Purdue Pharma hadn't been found guilty of the crimes that I had sketched out in the book. So, you know, Hollywood said, 
well, we love the story, but are they bad people? Are they good people? They haven't been convicted of anything as yet. So they were kind of like going, well, we're not ready to go there. Uh, and then in uh, 2017, right around the time you started this podcast, you know, the story started changing. There was a whole new level of attention brought to it. You know, the states began a new series of lawsuits against Purdue and the Sackler family. And I was contacted by two screenwriters, uh, Micah Fitzerman Blue and Noah Harpster, who had been writers on the show Transparent and were doing television series as well. And they loved the book. They wanted to do something with it. I went, go with God, guys, you know, but it turned out that as is often the case, it's time had finally come. And it bounced around for a while, first at Amazon, then it went to Netflix, where it was sort of joined together with a story that Patrick Graydon Keith had written for The New Yorker about the Sackler family. And it found its way uh, to Eric Newman, who was the ex executive producer of Narcos. And he brought it in to Netflix and they greenlit it. That's and then awesome. it was several years, be, you know, between it, the time it was shot and, and today. Well, it's a series that everybody needs to watch. You know, I think so often, and I've talked about this on the podcast before, People think that just because they don't have a family member that's addicted or that has suffered from addiction or they themselves have not suffered from addiction, that this, this problem and this situation and this story doesn't affect them, but it's just not true. It affects every single person in this country, if not the world, and everybody. So everyone knows about, everyone's heard about, everyone has uh, preconceptions about, they've made assumptions about. And I think one of the things that the show does, and I'm very grateful for how it does it, is that you realize, even if you think you know a lot about this subject, you know, oh, I read about this, I don't really need to see a show about this. It sort of dispels all those preconceptions mm -hmm. and you start seeing all of this through fresh eyes and, and and i think that's extremely important too to understand this in a way that's you know that's not bound up in, in what your preconceptions are i completely agree and um having watched as much of it as i have um it's extremely hard hitting and it needs to be hard hitting because, you know, as I say, people just, they, do, they cannot necessarily confront, you know, the evil involved in the Purdue, the Purdue company and the Sackler family. And it's, it's something that um, people need to see. They need to know. Well, you know, I mean, you, I you as an start, sorry, go ahead. From the start, I mean, I, I was, you know, the decisions that were made in the show by Eric Newman, the producer, and Peter Burry, the director. I mean, some of them were revelations to me. Like, you know, normally at the start of a show like this, that's a dramatization of a real story, you'll have a disclaimer that will say something like, you know, this is dramatic, real uh, telling of a story, you know, none of the characters depicted are real and blah, 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 sort of like, well, you don't have to take this really seriously, folks, because we've sort of made it up. But as you've seen, this show starts with something very real, which are the parents of children are the parents who have had children lost to this 
yes. whose children were prescribed these drugs by doctors, by people whom they trusted, and the tragic consequences that ensued. And I think that that sets a tone and a seriousness that is inescapable. I agree. Barry, was there anything while you wrote this story that, I mean, you're, I don't want to say you're a hardened investigative reporter, but you've looked into very controversial and, you know, nasty situations. Was there anything in this one that surprised you? I would say that there is practically nothing in this that didn't surprise me. Mm. Uh, you know, I grew up believing that doctors, I revere doctors. I still revere doctors. But I believe that doctors were like the bedrock of our society. They were people in, into whom we could place our trust that they would always act in our benefit and you know when i started researching the sackler family and researching arthur sackler dr arthur sackler who was basically the patriarch of the sackler family and who in the 1950s and 1960s uh, essentially created a whole new industry, which was, what, which was the advertising of prescription drugs. You know, before Arthur Sackler, drugs were not promoted by drug companies to doctors. There was sort of a, a wall there. And Arthur Sackler created all these madman-style advertising and promotional techniques like paying doctors to be pitchmen for drug companies, planting fake news stories about the wonders of drugs, uh, starting magazines that wrote glowing reports about drug companies that were sponsors of the magazines, uh, corrupting and co-opting uh, co FDA officials. I mean, you name it, it all traces back to Arthur Sackler. Hmm. And what I found so extraordinary is that all these techniques that were pioneered by Arthur Sackler and who died in 1987 before the first tablet of Oxycontin was ever sold would be utilized by his brothers, Arthur and Mortimer, and other members of his family, including his nephew, Richard Sackler, who ran Purdue during Oxycontin's boom boom years, to promote what arguably was the most powerful and potentially addicting narcotic ever marketed by the pharmaceutical industry. I mean, essentially, Purdue used techniques to market Oxycontin that other companies used to promote, you know, like a diuretic or, you know, a heart, you know, high blood pressure medication. You know, they gave away hats to doctors. They gave away plushy pills to doctors, T-shirts, you know, CDs, get into the swing where old people were dancing again because of Oxycontin. And they turned a drug that was extremely valuable into in very limited situations like, you know, the treatment of cancer pain or right. serious ongoing chronic pain. They realized in order to make billions, they had to pitch this drug as good for every kind of pain, be it back pain, dental pain, sports injury pain, you name it. Yep. Heavy duty. I mean, heavy duty. They, their marketing techniques are like no others. They were masters at Absolutely. it. Absolutely. The consequences of it 
were absolutely disastrous. Well, they were marketing addiction and they were marketing death. Well, they, you know, as I discovered in my investigation, you know, they knew, or I, you know, I found inf information showing that they knew one, that the claim that, you know, Oxycontin's slow release formula would, you know, reduce its abuse wasn't true. And two, that the abuse of the drug took place almost immediately. And, you know, one of the most shocking things to me was, you know, in 2017, uh, seven, uh, 10 years after the Justice Department settled its case against Purdue, I was given a memo, a 120-page memo that was written by the prosecutors in, in Virginia who brought the case against the company and its executives and who wanted to charge those executives with serious felonies, you know, crimes that would, if convicted, would send them to jail. And I thought I knew a lot about this story. And when I looked at this document, I was completely stunned <laughs> by, you know, the evidence that suggested the level of deception that was going on the level of contempt for doctors that Purdue had, and even the level of disregard for the people who they claimed they were championing, pain patients. Now, maybe in court, Purdue would have, you know, turned this around and shot down all these allegations that prosecutors were prepared to make. But I really believe that if this this case had gone forward and this evidence had seen the light of day in 2007, that sort of the trajectory of the opioid epidemic could have been blunted and bent. That's, that's a very, very valid point you make. And I agree with you completely. So the Netflix series is out on the 10th it, of August? Yes, it starts uh, on Thursday, okay. August. It's uh, six hour-long episodes. It has a fabulous cast, uh, including Matthew Broderick, who plays Richard Sackler. In other words, a guy who you automatically associate with... Uh, nice people like Ferris Bueller uh, playing someone who's eh, not so nice. Yep. And uh, Uzo Obudo, who plays a composite character who serves as the investigator who realizes something is going on here and I need to find out what's happening. And Taylor Kitsch as well. And Taylor Kitsch. Let's not forget Taylor, yep. who is excellent yep. as Glenn, the mechanic who has an accident and uh, becomes addicted to oxy. Right. Well, thank you for what you thank do. You. Thank you for what you've done. Thank you for shedding the light on this story. It cannot be talked about enough. It cannot be promoted enough. And we will continue to promote it. And this Thursday, today is the 8th, two days from now, on Netflix. Y'all need to hours. watch the series. Yes. And so, yes. And, and, you know, thank you for having me on. I would encourage your, your listeners to watch the show, read the book, and understand how this happened and why we have to make sure it never happens again. Exactly. And I'm assuming the book is on Amazon. It is, most definitely. Barry, I cannot thank you enough for talking to us today. I know thank that you, you are so super busy with interviews. Thank you. It is a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening. 
The book is Painkiller by Barry Meyer, M-E-I-E-R. And the series is on Netflix starting this evening, starring Matthew Broderick. I can say that. Matthew Broderick, Uzo Aduba, and Taylor Kitsch, among others. This is a story that needs to be told. Um, I know that there's a lot of attention on fentanyl right now, but this is still a, a valid story that everybody needs to know about. It's amazing how many people don't know about it. This is a very hard-hitting series. This is not for your children. Be prepared. And we'll be back again with another interview next week. You have been listening to The Addiction Podcast, Point of No Return. For more information, reach out to us on Facebook or go to www.theaddictionpodcast.com. Our email is theaddictionpodcast at yahoo.com.